Okay, here we go. Uh, this is me again, Asam Hilmi, a success partner with OBA Energy. And I will be your moderator in today's webinar. We have a very interesting webinar today uh, with the title Introduction to Data Analytics in Petroleum Engineering. Uh, as usual, in the start of the webinar, I will be giving a short presentation about OBA Energy and the services that we provide. So this presentation uh, is introducing OBA upcoming services plan. Uh, in the beginning, this is our dashboard. As you see, we, we have teams not only in Egypt, but in other countries as well. We have a group of very talented uh, instructors with various and different ex uh, experiences uh, uh, in different uh, aspects in the oil and gas industry. Uh, you can also see in this screen that we have already provided some interesting live courses, more than four, 30 live courses that we have uh, already available now uh, as recording courses. Also, as I will introduce in the uh, next few slides, we also provided uh, more than uh, 65 webinars. This is uh, the, webinar, the webinar number 66. And uh, these this all webinars are free webinars. If you missed any you know, of these webinars, you can find them on uh, our uh, uh, social media platforms, especially on YouTube. Uh, we, we also have provided mentorship programs that we, I will give a hint about this program in the next slide. You can see that we are presented on all social media platforms, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you for following us. Uh, we, we already reach it almost everywhere in the world. Uh, so, so just as I mentioned in the beginning that we have a very interesting wave of courses uh, that will be conducted in, in May this month and, and not in next month in June. We have four interesting courses, starting with uh, water flooding design and optimization uh, that will start in, uh, in 13th of May and end by the 18th of May. Uh, uh, also, a pretty interesting course in the uh, artificial lift technology uh, was a course titled the gas lift theory operation and design that will be uh, in, in the 27th of May and the end by the 1st of June. Uh, two more courses uh, that are actually very interesting courses as well. Uh, the third one is Advanced Integrated Formation Evaluation, uh, which will be in the 10th of June and last uh, till the 15th of June. And the last uh, course uh, in the operation of the oil and gas industry, uh, a very interesting dynamic course uh, titled uh, advanced well intervention operations that will be our last course for this wave uh, that will start uh, in uh, on the 24th of, of June and end by almost at the end of the June on the 29th. So you can also see that we provide one day uh, break uh, during these courses uh, that is usually on Tuesdays as highlighted in black, uh, light black color in my screen. Here is a QR code if you'd like to register in any of these uh, upcoming live courses. And you can uh, see also the, the link uh, to fill in the registration form. I just sent it in the chat uh, area. You can also uh, scan this QR code. Uh, uh, as I mentioned that we have already provided more than 30 live courses that are now available as recording. Uh, a very interesting topics here, like in different software uh, that are most uh, common, well-known software in the oil and gas industry, uh, like uh, OPM, uh, CAB, PipeSAM, uh, CrackCAD, uh, Afire, Betrill, all these are interesting courses. Uh, also, we have some technical courses, uh, very interesting courses as well, like Introduction to Data Analytics, uh, perforation design, regular soil intervention, ESB hand and software design. What's next? Uh, here is the here is the QR code for the big sale. We already provided uh, uh, a very interesting discount for the more courses you you register with us. So you can also use the same links in the chat area to register in these courses. As I mentioned, we have uh, a very interesting experience. Uh, different than the live and recorded courses, which is a mentorship program. You and the instructor, you choose, you design your learning journey based on your preference. You choose an instructor and the uh, number of hours that you like to learn. 
uh, we have already conducted many mentorship programs uh, and different uh, uh, technical studies and uh, areas of expertise. So uh, I would like to encourage you to visit our website. Uh, this is a screenshot from our, our website. You can find there very interesting courses. All the recorded courses are there. Uh, here is another screenshot from the website. And we already uh, conducted uh, uh, two uh, land on ground internship programs for different group of students from Lebanon. You can see on this gallery some pictures from their visits to some of interesting uh, uh, service companies here in Egypt, like uh, Big Fuse, Shnabashe, and other uh, field visits in the desert of Egypt. Uh, next. Yes, we almost done. So if you'd like to become one of the ambassadors of OBA Energy, uh, you can do this easily by joining us in one of our services and enjoy the, uh, the privileges that we provide to our ambassadors and uh, the number of discounts that we offer to all of them. Uh, I, have, I have some rules for starting this webinar before introducing our promising uh, guest speaker for today's webinar. Uh, please keep your camera closed uh, as I already muted all your microphones. Sorry for this. Well, this is for uh, the clearance for all the participants in this webinar. Uh, if you have a question, please put your question in the chat area and I will read your question by the end of the webinar to our instructor. Uh, if you joined using a uh, different name, uh, like Galaxy, iPhone, uh, something like this, please rename yourself and we will be sending certificates of attendance for this webinar in one week from today. Uh, thank you, and uh, now is the time to introduce our uh, guest speaker, a very promising instructor for today's webinar, Engineer Osama Abdelazim. Engineer Osama is a production technologist with more than four years experience. His role focuses on production optimization. He is uh, enthusiastic about digital oil fields and applications of machine learning. He has a publication about uh, the implementation of computer vision in diagnosing uh, water production mechanisms in oil well. Uh, actually, it's very interesting to find uh, versions uh, with technology in the oil and gas industry, which is very important. Thank you, Engineer Osama, for joining us for today. Uh, I, I now will stop my share, and the mic is yours to start your webinar. Thank you, thank you, Hassan, for your introduction. And I'd like to thank Upa Energy for giving me the opportunity to have this session with you. And I hope you could find it fruitful. So today, uh, just a second, I'm going to please share my presentation. Yeah. So <clears throat> today, uh, we're going to have a short webinar. Uh, it would be around 40 to 45 minutes, and I would be happy to have a discussion with you after the webinar finish and answer all your, answer all your questions. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about production about data analytics in petroleum engineering. It's divided into two parts. The first one is basics of data analysis and machine learning. Next, we will go to apply some data analysis approaches and machine learning approach in one of the public fields of more of the data set, which is available on internet. So we, we can start with artificial intelligence definition, which data analysis and machine learning evolves around. So it's the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, which might be able to solve problems and infer information like, like us, like humans. I'd like to start our webinar with this quote uh, said by Eliza Yudwesky. Uh, he said, by, by far the greatest danger of artificial intelligence is that people conclude too early that they understand it. Actually, AI is a very big field and there is a continuous search that contributes to it every day. So we, we could never say that we understand it fully enough. Every day, there are new technologies and there are new approaches, new algorithms. So all we need to do is to keep ourselves updated with the latest the published models or techniques. And essentially, we should keep ourselves 
um, have good knowledge of basics and fundamentals of artificial intelligence and machine learning because it would be always necessary for us to understand the future of artificial intelligence. So today we are going, as I have introduced, we are going to we are going to close, we are going to talk about two topics: data science intro and the simple example using both data set. For data science intro, we will talk about statistics, data analysis, computer science, machine learning, and what domain knowledge we should have to be able to call ourselves data scientists. So in this slide, we can show the main components of data science. As we could see, it consists of computer science, as we have already mentioned, computer science, machine learning, data science, traditional software, business or domain expertise, data analysis, mathematics, and statistics. So what are we going to know by the end of this session? I believe by the end of the session, we would have some fundamental understanding of this concept, and we would try ourselves how to apply machine learning algorithm on real field data set, and we can encounter some problems or some ideas which we might have and try to find how to solve it using machine learning. So briefly, we would say that statistics is a branch of mathematics. It allows us to study and manipulate data using different data sets. I believe we all already have some basic knowledge of statistics or mathematics. So we, we are good with it. For data analysis, it employs statistical techniques to describe and visualize data efficiently. We use the knowledge we had from statistics to visualize and infer results and conclusions. Computer science is really a major contributor to data science. So we cannot solve algorithms using papers or using our hands. We should use computer and machines. So we should be aware of some computer science concept and some programming language, such as Python or R, whatever language you're going to use. Machine learning, it focuses on integrating algorithms which could imitate human performance or human, human ability to predict performance of some data based on the history of it. For business or human expertise, it's a must for any data scientist that they must have some domain knowledge. For example, you can you can't have knowledge of computer science only and work on the field of petroleum engineering as a data scientist because you wouldn't understand the basics. You wouldn't understand how oil is produced or how process, yeah, processing uh, operation happen. So we will quickly pass through every, uh, through every concept of them. We will start by statistics. We could say that statistics could be divided into two parts, descriptive and statistics and inferential statistics. So whenever we're working with data, we usually work with sample data, even whatever how big the data is, it's usually the sample. We, don't, we could never have the population, the population data set. For example, if we're working with oil, oil data set or oil field data set, even if it consists of hundreds of wells, it would never be inferential to the population data set. Population here, we mean the entire oil wells around the world. However, the sample is the number of wells that we are working on. So we use descriptive statistics to describe uh, and acquire some overview of the given data set. We use some techniques such as mean, median, standard deviation, or mean absolute deviation. However, we use inferential statistics to try to infuse the sample to the population. So we, for example, we can have some hypothesis which we try to prove <clears throat> or which we try to conclude using our sample data. We can usually use some kind of tests like chi square test, t test, or this or z tests. There are multiple 
this and there are multiple statistical tests which we can be used based on the type of the problem we are having. Next, we will go to data analysis. And we would say that data analysis could be described or could be divided into four groups descriptive analysis, diagnostic analysis, or we can say it's exploratory data analysis, predictive analysis, and prescriptive analysis. So someone saying that they don't have a uh, clear voice. Can you hear me well? Okay. Okay, so as we have said, as we have mentioned, the analysis could be could be divided into four categories: descriptive analysis, diagnostic analysis, predictive analysis and prescriptive analysis. For descriptive analysis, it depends on the statistical data which we have already that uh, we can use statistical techniques such as mean or median as we have already mentioned to do some, to have summary or some description of our data set. However, for exploratory data analysis, we usually use it to explore hypotheses. And for predictive analysis, we can use it to try to find patterns in data set and try to ex uh, and try to predict it and how the model would predict uh, how the model would perform in the future or with an uh, unknown data set. Descriptive analysis it's really important because it is the key of how we could answer business questions because data analysis evolves around answering business questions and achieve KPIs. So. If, if, you're, if you're talking about data analysis in, in steps, like how, how we could deal with real field data set. So the first thing would be, we need to define why we need data analysis. We have to have, or we have to define the objective of our work. Next, we need to collect data from different sources, from either it's from offline or online sources like, if you're using data from internet or using the data from your own company or however you had your data. And then we have to, we have to clean our data. We can use different data learning techniques. We will talk about it in our example. And next we will have to try to analyze our data set and find some insights in it. And the final step would be to interpret results and apply them on unknown data set. So if we're talking about the most the common software or computer uh, computer programming language which we use for machine learning, it would usually be Python. Python is high level general purpose programming language. And it's very easy, very easy to use. So you can easily use it and learn it. So there are main packages for data analysis we, which, we, which we usually use in any in any day and on any project you're working with, such as NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Seaborn, SciPy and Stats Model for statistics, Scikit-Learn for machine learning, PyTorch and TensorFlow for deep learning, while H2O and PyCard it's used for automatic machine learning projects. And today we are going to use H2O for automated machine learning. However, for petroleum engineering, there are some packages which we can use which are already available for everyone to use, such as Wally, Lassio, and Lassio. For example, on, we could see this 3D trajectory of our wheel that was uh, uh, introduced using Wally. Uh, you could find the source of the, the figure here, and you can check it if you want to have further details about how to use Wally, Lassio, or Lassio, because it's specified for the genes. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about machine learning. So uh, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which both are a subset of artificial intelligence. If we're going to talk about machine learning, we would have first to describe types of machine learning. We could find that it could be divided into supervised learning, unsupervised, and semi-supervised. 
supervised learning, it usually works with label dataset. For example, we can find it here on the left chart on our presentation. It, it differentiates, it differentiates between unsupervised learning and supervised learning. For supervised learning, we already have labels. For example, we have every we have x and y. So we have for each value of x, we have value of y, whether it was class one, class two, or whether it was unknown. For unsupervised learning, we don't have labels. So we only have values of x. So we try to cluster the values of x and try to find some clusters which bring uh, the most common points together into groups. Like we can see here, we divided our set into five groups or five clusters. Here we have our supervised data set. Uh, so if, if you're talking about machine learning and deep learning and how we could use both of them, machine learning usually works for tabulated data. So we usually need to have the data in a structured format like tables so we should have attributes or features and we could have either we have label or not however deep learning could work with unstructured data set unstructured data set could be defined like uh, images as we could see here in, in the right figure it could be audio messages or voice uh, we could use deep learning for different applications like segmenting of segmenting objects as we can see here on our data set we can segment buses or cars and people uh, we can use it for semantic segmentation and when we work with uh, voice or voice data we usually work with natural language processing and we can use something like recurrent neural networks or long short term memory. So that's briefly the difference between machine learning and deep learning. If you're going to talk about machine learning algorithms, there are many, many algorithms which we can use, as we have mentioned earlier. There are regression, classification, clustering, and dimensionality reduction. We could see that regression and classification are both types of supervised learning. And linear regression is trying to find a linear or a linear representation of a line which could fit a set of data. However, classification it works with the same concept. However, it needs to convert the data into binary zero or one. Uh, clustering represents unsupervised learning, and dimensional reduction also represents, un, represents unsupervised learning. So, as we have mentioned, scikit-learn is the most common library of Python, which uses machine learning or, or which allows us to employ machine learning techniques. We could see that for regression, we can use lasso or elastic net or support vector regressor and sample regressors. And for classification, we can use key neighbors or support for vector classifier or naive base. We will introduce some of those algorithms, so you might have some insights about it. And we will mention here in this slide. Here is the difference between different algorithms. So right here in the left, we could see this is the linear regression. We have independent variable and dependent variable. And as we have mentioned earlier, we have both X and Y, so it is supervised learning. So what we're trying to do is to find a line that fits this data with the minimal loss. This is a very simple linear regression approach. Here, however, we could see that it's a classification. We have our dependent variables either as one or zero. Uh, essentially, it's, it's a we use a similar approach to linear regression. However, we use some activation function. Here, for example, we're using some activation function, which is called sigmoid. Sigmoid is used to transfer our, the probability of our linear regression model into values between 0 and 1. And then we have to select our threshold. Here, for example, we are selecting 0.5. And 
hereafter we can say that points higher than 0.5 would be one, while points lower than 0.5 would be considered zero. So now we transferred it from linear regression into binary regression or classification. Uh, here, the upper left figure, for example, it represents something called supportive vector machine. It works on the idea of kernels. For example, if you could see here, we have X and Y, and we have two labels, the purple one and the red one. If we're trying to find some, if we're trying to find some, some linear algorithm or classification or whatever, or whatever algorithm to differentiate between, to, to fit between the purple and the red ones, we would find that it should be a circular one like this, it should be here. However, we don't have an algorithm which could do it efficiently unless we use kernels. Kernels have the concept of transferring the 2D data or do the two-dimensional data set into a higher dimensional data set. For example, it could be 3D or 4D or 5D or much higher than that. For example, here we convert it from 2D into 3D. So now we can, could see that it's much easier to separate between the paper points and the red points. We could just have a hyperplane here, which could separate between the two classes, and we could efficiently separate between them and find an algorithm which could be used to predict unknown data set. Uh, and here, it's similar algorithm. So, if we're talking about the machine learning project life cycle, it's, it's not only about algorithms. So it could be divided into four approaches, scoping, data modeling, and deployment. For scoping, as we have said, and actually it is the most important step in any project is to define the project. You should have a solid idea that you're going to work with. It's not just you want to employ machine learning algorithms on some petroleum engineering field data. You should have some idea that you really need to solve using machine learning. So after you scoop your data or after you scoop your idea, you define your data set and establish baseline. Baseline, you usually establish it for unlabeled data set. Which don't have uh, which don't have it. So we can use different different approaches for. We can use different approaches to label our data set using different deep learning techniques such as generative, uh, such as generative adversarial uh, uh, neural networks for working with images. And next, we have to label and organize our data set. We have to remove any data that might have been entered in our data by errors or whatever. And the third step would be modeling. We have to do select and train our model and perform error analysis. There are several error analysis metrics which could be used. And actually it depends on the type of the problem. For example, we can use accuracy, a recall, uh, and precision or F1 score for classification. While we could use R2 or I mean, absolute error or whatever error or evaluation metrics we can use for linear regression problems. When we work with computer vision, we usually work with mean average precision or mean intersection over union uh, metrics. And eventually, we do deployment for our model. And actually, deployment for any model is a very essential one. It's not the end of our project. Actually, it's the start of our project production. When we deploy our model into production, we could deploy it as a stand as a as a standalone software or, or on a cloud as an integrated part of a larger approach or workflow. And all we have to do is to monitor and maintain our system to find how our data, how the data act and to find if there was data shifting or any problem with our data in the future. For example, our model, which, which we might have introduced with accuracy of 
it could approach accuracy of 70% after one or two months of deployment. So we have to monitor and maintain our system and to find why the model performance deteriorated like this. We have to work on our data and to describe or find outliers or whatever the reason was for making this problem. And whenever we work with our data set for here we're talking about modeling part, we have to divide our data set into training, validation, and testing data sets. We usually use, we usually use training data for the algorithm to learn how to learn the patterns in the data and try to memorize it. And then we use validation data to optimize our hyperparameters. Eventually, we use testing data to try the model on, on unseen data and to see how it will act on data that it has never seen. And actually, we evaluate our model using validation and testing set. Training is just used for, for learning, learning purposes. So this was just a brief introduction about machine learning. I didn't go in, into details about each model, just an introduction. And next, we will talk about application of data analysis and machine learning in theory engineering. And today we will pick the first one for production engineering and prediction of bottom hole flowing pressure of oil wells. Um, machine learning could be used for different segments such as production or drilling engineering or civil engineering. And actually, if you have research on internet, you could find that there are several papers that are published every year that addresses those problems. So today we, we just want to talk about how to predict the more flow pressure of oil wells. Uh, I'll just, yeah. I'll share you. Okay, so here we are going to use data analysis to predict bottom hole flowing pressure of volume data set. Actually, what we are going to do now is five steps. First, we're going to do exploratory data analysis and show characteristics of wells. Next, we will do data visualization and have some insights about data. And we will see how we could transfer our daily production data into monthly production data. We could apply this approach for hundreds of wells, like in a glance. And eventually, we will do just a dummy model or a dummy machine learning model to predict what more flow equation. So, the data we use is Volve Data Village. It's available on Equinir website. So, you can just click on or you can just Google it and you will find the data set available, available publicly for research purposes. And you can apply the same approach we will do. So, the first step. We will import the main libraries, which we are going to use for our approach. As we have mentioned, we, we will import NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Seaborn, and some other libraries such as Random and Missing Ignore. So after we import them, we, have, we would have to show how our data set look like. So we, we just load our data set to use Pandas, pandas to, 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 to illustrate it. NumPy and pandas. Mm. NumPy and are different approaches. NumPy could usually handle mathematics and equations, while pandas, it's more like Excel sheets. It allows us to represent data and work with it and manipulate it. Here we have defined our data set. We could see that it consists of uh, Actually, it's not five words because we are just showing the head of our data frame. It consists of 24 columns. If we want to see the size of our data set, we can just use the data frame to check. We can see that our data set consists of 15,000 rows and 24 attributes. So next step, here we could see the attributes or columns of our data set. We could see data, data of production, we could put uh, on streaming hours, average oil health temperature, and gas volume and oil volume. So before we work with our data set, 
we usually prefer to have our columns name and lowercase so that we can easier recall them. It's just an approach. You don't need to know it if you don't like it. So we just convert our columns into lowercase. And then we select the features which we are concerned with. So we would like to see the production, name of wells, our streaming hours, the amount of pressure, bullet temperature, and type of flow. Also, as you could see here, we couldn't see, we cannot visualize the entire 24 columns just by calling a data frame. You can see here that average downhold pressure and average choke. There are some features missing here. If you if you look here, you would find that we are missing average downhole temperature, average delta P tubing, average address pressure, and average choke size. It's not missing, it's just we cannot visualize them. So we recall something like bandas, it's an option to display the maximum columns or maximum number of columns. So if we just visualize that, we would see now that we could see our newly created data set with lowercase columns, and we could see and visualize a number of features. If you're trying to find uh, some, if you're trying to find some, uh, like some information about our data set, we can just call data from the info, and we it, it could show us the data type of each column. For, for example, float floating or float six four, it represents Numbers while object represents strength and date time six four it represents date. So the first column is dates while those are numbers, and here it's objects or strength. And we could also see number of non-null of non -null objects or non-null cells. We could see that for almost for for all or for every column we have many missing data. So if you want to visualize how this our the location of the missing data, we can use missing no library, which would show us how the data missing are. So we could see that most of the data are missing in the lower part or in the lower section of our data set. So we need to describe or we need to find what is the reason for this type of missing data or reward or if there is any pattern for missing information. So before we do it, we have to do some descriptive statistics. We will show mean standard deviation, median, IQRs, and min and max for every single attribute. And we can see here our data set. For example, here we can see in pool water volume, we can see that there is a negative value for the pool water volume. So if we're working with production oils, we have to remove this value. If we could see uh, this function, did from describe, it only shows uh, the statistics of numerical data. However, it doesn't show for any objective data. So we would recall another function, or we would recall include object, and we could see it for number or name of will and full kind we we'll find that we have seven wells, and the most frequent well is 15 over 9 F4, which, is, uh, which have almost 3,000 uh, points. However, for flow kind, we have two, ty two types of flow. If we need to further describe what type of flow we could have, we can just call value counts. We can see that we have Almost 58% of our data set production data sets, uh, production data points, and 41% is injection. If we move it to zero, we find that we have 9,000 uh, production data points and 6,000 injection data points. So if we just call our data set as we are only into, we are only concerned with production data set. And then we can recall this. But find that, oh, sorry, we need to use the production. We could find that we don't have much missing data now. Actually, most missing, missing data for wallet pressure and temperature, it was with injection wells, like as you could see here. 
So all those it was injection for injection wells. So now we knew the reason why there were many missing data. So for our production data, we have 9,000 rows and 12 attributes. So uh, how, how we could handle those missing data? By, in every column, we have NAND values. NAND represents our, it means not a number. So how we could deal with it? There are many approaches which we can use to handle missing data. The easiest one is to do them or to use statistical techniques such as mean or median. The, the most, uh, um, some, some complicated approaches to use machine learning for something which is for data imputation. For example, we can use attributes of, uh, we can use attributes, attributes which don't have missing data to predict the missing data here. And then we can impute for it. Here, because we're just showing a uh, mini example, we will just drop the missing data. And now we will show information. We could see that we don't have any missing data now. All our data set is, is filled with numbers or objectives. And we have 8,980 non null uh, data points. Um, for example, here in our data set, they, they use Pool oil volume in a standard uh, cubic meter, water pressure in oil, and water temperature in stasis. So, for convenience, I just converted, in, I converted them into PSI for the night and value per day. So, just um, typical conversion. And now we can show production of uh, production, our production data. Now we can see that our average downward pressure, for example, on First day here, it's around 4,500 psi, while here it was 310 pounds. So that's the difference. It's just for companies. Um, next, we will only, for the purpose of our model to predict the bottom oil pressure, we will only work with one well. Here we selected 15 over 9 F12. So here is the data of the well. For convenience, also we will convert the name of columns from average downward pressure to PWF, TWF, water temperature, Q gas, and Q oil. So now we have our data set like this. Um, when we're trying to work with our data set to predict bottom oil pressure, I, I don't need to use average delta B because it's already a function of bottom oil pressure, so I cannot use it. So I will drop it. Also, I will drop for kind because I already selected a well which only has production data, and I will sell, I will do whole pool name because it doesn't make sense to use whole pool name to predict bottom hole pressure. So now this will be our data set. If we want to do some visualization for our data set, we can just do some scattered plots. So we scattered plots uh, of Date against liquid production, whether it was oil production green or water production blue. And we could see how production is distributed along this time from 2008 to 2017. If you want to find correlations or to quickly visualize correlation between each two columns or each two features, we use pair plot. It allows us to find the correlation between each two columns. I'm trying to zoom in so that you can see. So here, for example, we could see that oil production and the gas production is strongly correlated to each other. So there's a very strong correlation between Q oil and Q gas. It's a very direct correlation. However, for, for example, for Q oil and Q water, it's negatively correlated, but it's not strongly negative. Like it's not a straight line. We cannot fit the line to, to say that it's, it's strongly negatively correlated. For other features such as water well pressure and QL, we could find that there is no much uh, correlation between both. Actually, there is some correlation, but it's not strongly enough. So if you want to find the actual values of correlation or correlation uh, values between each two features, we use something called 
uh, data frame per correlation, and we visualize it using a heat map. So here we could find the correlation between each two features. For example, Q oil and the Q gas, we could find that the correlation is one. Well, it's very strong. However, for Q oil and Q water, it was negative 0.44. So it's a negative correlation. However, it's not strong enough. So strong correlation, it's usually higher than 0.7. Uh, medium correlation between 0.3 and 0.7. Uh, no correlation or poor correlation is below 0.3 and it applies for negative values as well. So as we have said, now we have our data set. So if we just visualize uh, our data set like this, we, we, we now have our data set ready to be used for the machine learning project. We have our data points. We have around seven attributes on streaming hours, bottom hole flow and pressure, bottom hole temperature, wall head pressure, temperature, Q oil and Q gas and Q water. And we have our data points, every point or every example like this one, it represents daily production or daily daily data points. For, for example, this is the average daily bottom hole flow and pressure, average daily Q oil. However, for some instance, we might need to convert our daily production data to monthly production data to normalize our data set and to use it for our machine learning project or for whatever project to just uh, normalize it because we might have some anomalies into daily production data. So we use something called the resampling. We resample our data using month and we resample our Q oil and Q water and Q gas because we cannot resemble our pressures or temperature readings. We can just resemble or we can just average the daily or the monthly production uh, data points. So just to click on it, we can see now that our data our, our, our data set now, every data point or every point it represents the monthly data. For example, in February, the Average oil production was around 17,000. Average food production was 143. If you want to see how it finished on the last days of the oil, it's called the tail. We find that in September, 2000, September 2016, the oil ceased flu, while in August 2016, it was producing around 300 pallets of oil and 2,000 pallets of water. And we can just use a histogram. It's one of the statistical techniques to plot wall head pressure distribution uh, around the entire data set. And actually, it makes sense because uh, the oil usually starts with uh, higher wall head pressure, which we can see here, it's the lowest frequent values. And then the, the lowest values of full head pressure would be frequently, will have high frequency because it would be at the plateau production of the well. And here we could find the values of statistical summary of our data. You can just use box plot to represent our data in a statistical wise for Q oil, Q water, and PWF. And it actually it represents for Q1, Q2, and median and min and max. Now, after we have just prepared our data set for, for, uh, for being used in a machine learning model, we will call our necessary data set for our, our necessary libraries for machine learning. We usually call them from SQL. But here, for example, random forest regressor or whatever we want to use, support vector regressor, and we can recall some metrics. However, in this webinar, I will just introduce uh, an automated machine learning model. Uh, it, we, we don't usually use automated machine learning models. We usually build the model by ourselves. But here, just for the sake of time, and just for convincing, convenience and making it simple, I just try to use an automated machine learning model. So here we have selected our oil, and here's a distribution of our data set. 
um, here's here's uh, the our data set. So we are going to predict average long hold pressure. So we have to drop it for the X values or the features we are going to use to prediction. So for X, we will drop average down hold pressure. For Y, we will use average down hold pressure. So here is our X and here is our labels, Y. So that's it and that's why. Um, usually when we work with machine learning projects, we have to do some standard, standardization or normalization for our data set before we start working with. So that every feature would attribute or or contribute to the same way. So here I use min max scalar because it's much more effective when working with data that includes some anomalies. And here we would see the new distribution of our data. And actually it should be the same like this because many, uh, normalization and standardization it doesn't change the distribution of data, it just change, changes the values. So if we just Left it like this, we could see that we have the same distribution. Here is honest screaming hours and average will, will head pressure here. It's the same like this. Blue gas volume, the same like this. So we have the same values. Oh, we have the same distribution. The only change is the change of values. Um, for example, oil volume here, it was from zero to 1400. However, here it's from zero to one we would find that after normalization, we would have all our features have ranges from zero to one. For automated machine learning, I used H2O. It's very common to use and it's very easy one. So I will just not run H2O because it would take much time to run the model and train it using automated machine learning. So I'll have the results ready, ready for you. So here we divided our data set into training and testing. For example, 70% for training and 30% for testing. However, this training is already would, be, would already be divided into training and validation. And here we selected that we want our model to use maximum number of model 30. And we made our seed as 42. We, we usually use random seed with constant value so that our results could be reproducible so anyone can reproduce our data our 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 projects because machine learning approaches or the um, when we divide uh, divide our data set into training optimization and testing it usually happens in a random way so every time we run you we run our model we will have our data set divided differently data sets or different subsets. So making our random C constant would reproduce the same result and the same division every time. So that's how our model performed. So we will we were using functions of root mean square error, mean square error, mean absolute error. And here we could see the values of Training the data and the cross validation. As we have mentioned, the cross validation is it's part of the training model. It's, it's not the data set, or it's not the training data set. Um, here we would show, we, we used auto score to show how our model performed. So we could see that our model achieved 0.89 auto score on our testing data set and almost 2% average error for mean absolute error, mean absolute percentage error. And here we just did a quick visualization for the actual bottom hole pressure values and the predicted bottom hole pressure values. And here's identical lines that they should evolve around. We could find that we have some kind of good data fitting for actual bottom hole pressure values and predicted bottom hole pressure values. So that was quickly our our project about uh, how to use machine learning for for production reduction of bottom hole flowing pressure. So uh, if you have questions.
I'll be happy to listen to them. Thank you, Engineer Osama, for this interesting uh, webinar and really hard work. Uh, this is perfect, actually. I agree with you, Kano. Uh, so uh, now time for question, guys. If you have a question, please type it in the chat and I will read it to Engineer Osama. We actually got one question uh, earlier to this. Uh, uh, Kazi is asking about uh, the type of machine learning algorithm that are used uh, in the petroleum industry and how to train them uh, as he is he's a student with limited data access. Okay, actually we can use different type of machine learning models. As I have mentioned earlier, it depends on the type of the problem you are dealing with. You can use linear regression or classification or unsupervised learning. For example, if, if you are working with noise detection and production data or how to identify outliers in production data, you can use unsupervised learning techniques because you don't have labels that's it. If you're working uh, as uh, this example, if you're working with predicting bottom hole flow and pressure, we already have tabulated data, so we used linear regression. If you're trying to if you're trying to distinguish between two binary values, zero or one, for example, if the word is producing or not, you can use classification. Also, you, you, can, you could use much more advanced techniques. You can use deep learning. However, the approach you would use for deep learning, either uh, simple neural network or computer vision or recurrent neural networks. For example, I used computer vision working with some graphs because I had to determine or identify patterns in graphs. So I couldn't do it with conventional machine learning algorithm. I couldn't do it with classification or with linear regression. I had to, to use computer vision techniques. So actually it depends on the type of problem that you have. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, we have a question. I'm not sure that you are familiar with that, but uh, uh, Narian is, is asking, how machine learning is useful in real time drilling data monitoring. Uh, if you have a comment to add to this question. Okay, I don't put with drilling, but I know they already use it for real time drilling. For example, I know some applications for ROP monitoring and some examples for identifying early kicks. In, in drilling wells, it's actually they use it as a real time. They, they, if you Google that or use Google Scholar for session for real time application of drilling, you would find many. But mainly they use it to optimize the rate of penetration and to to identify early kicks before they happen. Because using machine learning to Mitigate uh, or mitigate risks or kicks or whatever hazards we have is a very essential and very useful approach for, for us to use, especially in learning, because learning engineering is usually associated with many hazards and many risks. So I hope this answer was helpful for you. Yeah, great. Uh, Abdul Hafiz is asking, uh, he is a field engineer. Or, or for a field engineer, what course uh, should uh, he select in data science for future school and career? I think he's asking about uh, how to develop his skill in, in, in uh, data science in general. Okay. Uh, I think you find many available courses online or internet. And uh, I need to emphasize on the point that all courses for data science are for free. You can find on YouTube, you can find on Coursera. You can find on Coursera, you can you could find courses for free from very well known universities. You can find from Stanford University or from Michigan University on EDX. You can find courses from machine learning from M for MIT. You could find several or several courses on the internet. You just need to start. Um, for, for a previous question, I just forgot to answer it. 
So someone was asking about as a student how he could use or uh, how he could find data to use with machine learning. Yes. I just yeah I, I I need to mention that there are many available data for data engineering available on the internet. For example, we use Wolf dataset. Wolf dataset is for a field in Norway, and everybody can download it. Actually, it contains data for drilling. And then it contains daily drilling reports. Contains data for survival sort of engineering, for geoscience, seismic, seismic models, production data, uh, and for and geology structure. So you can really use this this type of data set of Wolf data set for your research. And if you Google the it, uh, you will find that there are several published papers which were published for machine learning purposes using only Wolf data set. So you can just use one data set for, 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 for painting your model. And at the same time, you could find many types of data available. Okay, guys, uh, just a minute. I think that we lost connection with the engineer Osama. Uh, please, everyone, don't forget to fill in the feedback form. I sent it twice in the chat, and I will send it again now. So please take a moment to fill in this form uh, to help us improve our services that we provide. Uh, we also still waiting for Engineer Osama. I'm also, uh, if, if we couldn't uh, connect again, uh, I think uh, we can get, uh, we have still two questions not answered. Uh, so one from uh, Fasih and one from uh, Magid. Uh, I think we can we can answer them uh, on our social media uh, or send to your emails the answer. We will try to do this. If not, getting the uh, connection again. Hello, Engineer Osama. Are you hearing me? Oh, okay. Um, yes. Yes. I think that we have two more questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the first question is uh, someone is asking about the conceptual difference between data analysis, data, data machine learning, and and how they contribute to the developing of the learning guys. Okay. Actually, the data analysis. Any project that you are going to work on machine learning, the first step is to do data analysis. Actually, for any machine learning project, data analysis accounts for around 70 to 80 percent of your time working. Because unlike data sets which we usually work and work with on academic approach or for learning for or for for courses, for example, when you work with real data would find many missing data, you would find many problems with your data. Data wouldn't be consistent. Data wouldn't be usually in a structured way. 
if we're going to use with tabulated data, you will have to convert it to structured or tabulated format. So data analysis is very important for any machine learning engineer. Machine learning engineer uh, right now, if we're talking about machine learning engineers, they are all the ones who deploy machine learning uh, projects onto a cloud. And then they can monitor and maintain how the project works. As we have mentioned earlier, earlier in, our, in our presentation, the fourth or final step of machine learning uh, operations or MLOps, it's deployment. And actually now the classified machine learning engineers are the ones who work with deployment. So it's more like not just doing machine learning algorithm and developing it on a notebook. No, you just, you need to deploy it. So I hope you answered the question and the difference between the analysis and machine learning. So they both are very connected. You can't do machine learning without data analysis. And of course, you cannot do data analysis without knowledge of data engineering. So yes. it's all connected. It's, it's like a cycle. So if, if someone is looking to develop his skills in, in this area, I think he, he would start with data analysis first and then go to learning the science of machine learning. Yeah, sure. You need to learn data analysis before you start working on machine learning. Yeah, and I think also software engineering like Python is, is required for this. Yeah, sure, because you cannot do any data analysis projects in an efficient way unless you use software like Python. Also, some people use MATLAB. So if you are already familiar with MATLAB and you could use it efficiently, you can do machine learning use machine learning projects using MATLAB. There are several machine learning papers published using MATLAB. Also, some people use the software all for data analysis. It's not very common for machine learning. Yes. So, so due to time, I, I will uh, take one more question to answer before we end the webinar. Okay. Uh, I see a lot of questions like what are the AI, AI programs that we can use here in Gas and Dusty? Uh, and I'm not sure if, if there is a, a specific program and what, what programs they are asking about. If someone would like to clear uh, what, what they mean by uh, an AI program, uh, you mean by application, or would you like to add something to this, Engineer Osama? Someone is asking about uh, what are the AI programs yeah. that we use in the oil and gas industry? Yeah, uh, actually, there are many AI programs that have evolved recently. And uh, I think you can use them in different aspects, not only in petroleum engineering. But if you're talking about petroleum engineering and you're talking about specific programs which are used in Drilling or machine learning or uh, sorry, drilling or production. I think uh, most programs are made in home for each company, or they can just hire some companies or data analysis or machine learning companies which develop projects for them. So most projects for our companies are customized. For example, it's a project that is, as we have mentioned earlier, Earlier in our presentation, the first step in machine learning is to do scoping. So you have to define your objective and then you develop a machine learning approach customized to solve this problem. So every company might have different machine learning softwares. So there is no specific machine yeah. learning software that is common across all companies. And actually recently, some companies started to have their own machine learning team of data scientists to develop the, the programs for the company itself instead of hiring some other company or some other people to develop projects for them. Because as we have mentioned earlier, you should have domain knowledge or be domain expert in your, in your domain. For example, you should have both knowledge of theory engineering and the data analysis to to deploy useful projects or useful softwares. Yes. And I also would like to add to this that some companies uh, like the high tech companies like Schlumberger and the other service providers that you provide softwares started to include 
these tools and they're already uh, that they have softwares. So they started to include the, the new tools uh, of machine learning in their already existing software. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you again, Engineer Osama, for uh, sharing this informative knowledge with us. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like also to, to thank everyone in the meeting uh, for joining us for today and uh, look forward to meeting you in the next webinar. As I just uh, mentioned uh, earlier, that I sent the feedback link for this webinar in the chat. So if you didn't fill in, fill in the, the form, please do it before leaving the meeting. Thank you again and good night to everyone.